Hello, my name is Eric Musbarnes, and I'm the author of numerous novels, including the Vampire Noctuaries series. Now, many authors, they get really confused when creating an ebook as to what kind of format to use. Because ebooks can be made in a ton of different formats. AEH files used by the Arcos e-readers, uh, LRX files used by Sony e-readers, iBooks used by Apple e-readers, uh, PKG files used by Newton, .mobi files used by the Amazon Kindle, and .epub, which are used by, well, just about everyone else, including Barnes & Noble Nook e-readers. And there are actually even more formats than those. I mean, that's just a small sample. So, which one should you make? Well, the only formats you need to create are EPUB and MOBI. Forget all the others. EPUB is quickly becoming the industry standard, and 90% of e-readers on the market can open EPUB files. There is also a very simple conversion tool to change your EPUB into a MOBI. So, you really only need to make an EPUB and convert it to a MOBI, and your book will be accessible on 90% of the e-readers out there, including Nook and Kindle. And today on InkShard, I want to teach you something awesome, something that I have never seen anywhere else on the internet. I'll show you how to create an EPUB file that can be published. Now, the caveat that can be published is what makes my tutorial unique. See, there are plenty of tutorials on EPUB files, but they are all wrong for publishing. See, here's the issue. There's a big difference between an EPUB that conforms to validation standards and one that can be published. For example, when you want to publish a book with certain companies, they may have parameter requirements that must be present in your EPUB file, but those parameters are not required in order to validate the file. So you go to all this trouble to follow another tutorial, and you test your file and everything is valid, then the publisher rejects it. You have no idea why it was rejected, because you did everything right. The file works fine when you test it, it passes all the validation software, What's the problem? Well, the problem is you made an EPUB that can be validated, not one that can be published. I'm going to teach you how to create an EPUB file that is not only valid and properly formatted to all the standards, but it will also be accepted for publication at Amazon, Lulu, Smashwords, Barnes & Noble, and iBookstore. At the time this tutorial was created, I successfully published five of my own books to all of those distributors using these techniques. So I know it works. And before we begin, I want to warn you, this tutorial presumes you have some basic computer knowledge and basic HTML knowledge. Now if you don't know anything about file paths or directory structures or save dialogues, or how to turn on your file extensions, or basic HTML, you will be lost in this tutorial. It will be too technical and confusing. But if you know basic HTML, you'll be fine. Also, I'll be giving you these instructions on a PC. So if you use a Linux machine or a Macintosh, you might need to do things a little differently from the instructions, but all the basics are still going to be similar. Finally, I am not your free tech support. Okay, I love to help people out, but if you run into problems, I can't be answering 50 emails a day asking me to troubleshoot your mistakes. Okay, you gotta figure it out on your own. I'm, I'm, like, I'm like Morpheus in the Matrix. I could only show you the door. You're the one who has to walk through it. Okay, Neo? All right, let's get started. Okay, first, the software you'll need to create an EPUB. You're going to want a good text editor 
with syntax highlighting, such as uh, Note Tab++ or JEdit. You need a zip compression program, such as WinZip, and a good web browser, such as Chromium or Firefox. Now download the sample file that I have created for you from either the InkShard website, or you can link from, um, say, my own website. I'll, I'll mirror the file over there. EPUB files are very easy to create. In the simplest terms, an EPUB is comprised of carefully structured XHTML files and folders saved in a very particular way as a zip archive. Then you simply rename the zip extension to EPUB. Now there are a few general rules you need to follow. A, you want to save all of your XHTML as UTF-8 and add Unicode signature or BOM. B, make sure that you follow all the XHTML rules such as making sure you close all tags including line break BR tags and paragraph tags and line item list tags and things like that. By the way, it's very important that this next section be viewed at a resolution of 1920 by 1080 in full high definition. This next section is all screenshots, screen captures. So if it's not viewed at its native resolution, it's going to look a little bit blurry. Whether it's shrunken down or blown up, it's going to look kind of funky. So make sure you're at 1920 by 1080 for the optimal viewing experience. When you open up the zip file inside, you will find these two folders and this one file. Don't worry about the meta INF folder. That won't require any editing, and the MIME type will not require any editing either. All of the action, so to speak, happens right inside here. So we open up this, and we can see these three folders and two kind of control files. So let's go over what's inside all of these. Within images is exactly what you would expect. It has your front cover, your back cover, and an author photo if you're going to use one of those. Now, do not change the dimensions of these images. Obviously, you want to change the covers to your own cover of your own book, but keep them at 548 by 800 for both the front and back covers. The reason that you want to keep them at that size is because different e-readers have different requirements for the image sizes. Some of them want bigger images, some of them want smaller images, and I have found that these dimensions and this size is actually conforming to the greatest number of e-readers. So if you have it at this size, you should be pretty safe. Also, for some reason, most e-books do not have back covers, which I think is very strange. And I kind of wanted to start the trend of start putting back covers in e-books. Why not? I mean, real books have them. We know that we're at the end of the book when we're at the back cover. So an e-book should have a back cover as well. So once we move out of images, we go up to styles. Styles contains nothing but the style sheet. Again, you don't have to mess with this. You don't need to edit this at all. Just leave it alone. If you're really good at HTML and you're like an excellent programmer, feel free to get in there and tinker with it. After working at Walt Disney Studios for six years and building websites, I know my way around CSS pretty well, but I wouldn't mess with this if you don't know what you're doing. The next folder, this is kind of where all the action happens. The text folder contains all of the actual chapters and pages of your ebook. Now, this example has a lot of extra files in it, like a colophon, for example, a dedication page, epilogue. Those are things that you don't have to include. The only things that you really have to include are your table of contents, your title, your copyright, and the chapters themselves, of course, and the cover. And as I said, I think it's a good idea to start using some back covers. All the other files are optional. Now the other nice thing about the way I've set this up for you is the fact that there are 51 chapters, which is a heck of a lot more than most books are going to have. So if you're using this as your template, once you're all finished, you'll be able to just delete those excess files. So let's take a look at chapter one and see what we have going on there.
Now when we open up our chapter one inside of a text editor, we can see it's pretty simple. Uh, we have chapter one inside of our meta title. We also have an H1 with chapter information. And you notice that every single paragraph has an opened and closed paragraph tag. So there's an open and close on that paragraph, on that paragraph, there is on all of these. Now if we take a look at this page inside of the browser, we can see, again, pretty simple. The chapter one is right up here on top. And I actually included a lot of notes for you as you go through this. So for example, do not forget to close your paragraph tags. It's a requirement for XHTML. Bold can be done with regular bold tags, while italics can be done with italics tags. And then right here we see a few character codes for you know commonly used characters inside of a book. So we have the copyright, the section breaks, m dash, n dash, bullets, ellipses. And again, if we come back into our text editor, we can see all of those things. So bold can be done with regular bold tags. Here's the italics for the italics tags. And of course, here are all of the character codes for copyright, section, m dash, n dash. So when you're going to be working on your own book, you would basically come in here and delete all of this text and replace it with your text for chapter one of your own book and make sure that you conform to all these formatting standards of making sure you have closed tags on your paragraphs, you know, keep all of your code very simple, your bold with bold tags, italics with italics tags, and so on and so forth. Now while you're doing all of this editing to all of your chapter files, it is very, very important to remember to always check your work in a web browser. The reason that you want to do that is because the web browser can actually help you troubleshoot any problems that you might be having. For example, this right here is chapter one, it looks fine in our text editor, we come over here, it looks fine in our browser. But let's suppose that I made a few mistakes. Let's suppose I forgot to close my bold tag right here. So we'll just delete our end bold tag. And let's say I accidentally made the italic tag capitalized with a capital I instead of a lowercase. And maybe I forgot to end my li tag right here in my unordered list. So let's save this and come back into the browser and refresh it. And you will see that right here it's throwing an error and it's telling us exactly where the error is at on line 26 and it's telling us that it's an error in the i tag. And we also notice that if you go down here and we scroll down, the page stops rendering right here where the first error appears. So let's go back into our text editor and we will fix that first error that it's telling us about. So let's make this into a lowercase i again, resave it, and come back to our browser and we'll refresh. And you will see right down here, more of the page will end up rendering and the error message up here will change. So let's refresh the page and there we go. So now it's telling us our next error is in our b tag. And of course, as I just said, more of the page is rendering out. Now we can actually see all the way through the italic tags. But it's breaking as soon as it gets to the end italic. So let's give it that missing B tag, save it again. Now you'll see even more of the page render because it's going to go further through the page before it gets to the next error. And this error line will end up changing because it will no longer be on line 26. So let's refresh the page. And there we go. It's telling us there's an error on line 28 and there is a mismatch in the li tag. So once again, more of the page is rendering, but as soon as we get to the end of our unordered list, that's where everything breaks. So we come back in here, and once again, we add in the missing tag and resave the file. And then you should see, when we look in the browser, all these error messages will go away and the entire page will render once we refresh. So we refresh the page and there we go. No more error messages and the entire page is rendering. So once again, make sure that as you are creating all of your chapters, you're constantly going back and forth between your text editor and your browser to assure 
that all of your chapters are rendering and appearing the way that you intend them to. Once you've edited all your chapters and you have everything looking perfect and exactly the way you want it to be, the next three files that you should focus on editing are these, your title, your table of contents, and your copyright page. Now, the title page is pretty darn simple, obviously. All you're changing is the title and your name. So here in our text editor, we can see, don't forget this title though, the one that's in your metadata, in your header tag there. So change your book title up there, and then you add your book title in here, and then you put in your name. The next file we'll look at is the copyright page. Now the copyright page has some very specific parameters that you need to conform to. For example, at the very top of the page, the very first thing in the header is this, just the copyright with the copyright symbol, the year, and your name, and the all rights reserved. That appears right here in our text editor. We can see this inside of our H1 tag. Now, do not change this. I mean, obviously, yes, change the year to the appropriate year and change the name, but don't change the formatting. Some people want to go in there and throw in the title of their book above this. You can't do that. If you do, it will not be accepted by certain publishers. Again, this is one of those instances where this formatting is not a requirement for a valid EPUB file. However, it is a requirement for certain publishers. They're looking for this information inside of an H1 header tag as the very first stuff that appears on the page. So make sure that you conform to this formatting. Now all this information below it in this paragraph, this is not required. You don't have to put this in. You can change anything you want below these BR tags. So if, say for example, you have a photographer who has shot pictures that are in the book and you want to put in their copyright information or their contact information or any of the type of stuff that appears on normal copyright pages, you can throw all that stuff down here in the bottom. But the H1 tag, that is the one thing that you have to leave exactly as is. And then finally, we have the table of contents page the toc.xhtml. Now this, again, pretty self-explanatory. This is the table of contents page as it appears in the e-reader. So you have table of contents there, you have table of contents inside your H1. Make sure that you put your book title in here and put your name in here. And then what follows is all of the pages and links to every single page. So when we come here and we look at it inside the browser, we can see the table of contents, there's where the book title goes, there's your name, and as we click on all of these links, it takes us to the appropriate page. Click on dedication, we go to the dedication page, click on chapter 10, and we go to the chapter 10 page. So all you really have to do here is make sure that everything is there in the order that you want it to appear in in the book. Obviously. If you don't have this many chapters, say you've only got 30 chapters, you're going to have to delete all of this. You're going to have to come here inside your text editor and delete everything after chapter 30 all the way down to chapter 51. And any other links that you don't want, you take those out. If you're going to add in more chapters, you put in those, so on and so forth. You get the idea. So, table of contents and copyright and title page. All three of these are very, very important and they all need to conform to the formatting that is provided to you right here in this sample template. After you edit this stuff, you're pretty much done with everything that falls inside the text folder. And that's it. You're all finished with that. And the only files you have to edit then are the content.opf file and the toc.ncx file. The content OPF file contains a large number of nodes that need to be edited. So we start right here at the top. The very first node is the title node, and that is where your book title goes. And you need to make sure that your title conforms to the grammatical rules of book titling. 
The next block of nodes are these four right here, identifier, creator, publisher, and date. The identifier is typically the ISBN number of your book, but it can be any kind of unique identification serial number that you make up off the top of your head. The creator field contains your name. The publisher field has the name of your publisher. If you happen to be self-published, you just repeat your name in this field again. And the date field contains the date that your book is being released. Now once again, I know I've said this before, but I want to emphasize it. These fields are not necessarily required for EPUB validation, but they are required by certain publishers. For example, the date field is not required by anyone except Barnes & Noble. So if you were to delete that date field and you tried to validate this book, it would validate successfully. It would also be accepted for publication at places like Lulu and Amazon and Smashwords, but when you go to submit it to Barnes & Noble, it would get rejected simply because that date field was missing. So make sure that all these fields are included and make sure they have accurate data within them. The next set of nodes is the manifest. The manifest is basically just a file list of every single file that appears in your EPUB. So these do not need to be in any particular order, but it's a smart thing to put them in order simply because it's a lot easier to read. So first we list all of the HTML, XHTML files. Next we have all the images that appear in the book. Now this list needs to be 100% accurate and include everything that's there and not include stuff that doesn't actually appear. So, for example, if your book only has, say, 30 chapters, you need to make sure that you come in here and delete all of these extra lines and make sure that chapters 31 through 51 are gone. If your book has, say, no biography, you need to make sure that you come in and delete that line. Maybe your book has a lot of extra pictures in it, so you have to make sure that you list all of the JPEGs, all of the photographs that appear inside your book. You also need to make sure that this ID field right here has a unique variable, a unique name for every single object that appears within the manifest. So if you have, say, five new images, all of these have to be unique. Don't just copy and paste and leave it saying my cover image. You got to make sure that you change whatever is in the ID field as well. After the manifest comes the spine. Now the spine is the part that actually controls the order in which everything appears in your ebook. So obviously the very first thing on the list is the book cover and the very last thing on the list is the back cover. Now you'll notice that this is just listing pages. It's just listing chapters, listing sections of the book. It doesn't list all of the individual images in the style sheet the way that the manifest does. The ID ref variable right here has to match the ID identification in the manifest. So, for example, the copyright ID ref right up here matches the copyright page ID copyright. So all of that has to conform and correspond to one another. After the spine, we have the next node, which is called the guide. Don't worry about the guide. Just leave that alone. You don't need to edit that. You don't need to change it. That can stay exactly as is. Finally, the last file that you'll be editing is the toc.ncx file. Now the very first line that you'll want to change is this line right here, the meta content file which contains the unique ID. That needs to exactly match whatever you used here in your content OPF identifier field. So those two have to be exactly the same. The next thing that you want to edit is your book title which goes in here. And next you have the nav map node. Now within the nav map node there are these nav points. All of these have to conform to the order of pages that you laid out in your content OPF file. Namely, 
within the spine. So there is little extra information in here though. You can see that there are IDs, ID variables here within every nav point. We have title, we have copyright, we have TOC, table of contents, we have dedication, and all of these correspond to all your ID refs and they also correspond to everything in your manifest. Now, the thing that's really important about these nav points is this play order right here. The play order has to be chronological and you cannot skip any numbers. So it has to have every single number in there. So if you decide that you're going to delete some chapters, as I've said before, you, perhaps maybe you only have 30 chapters in your book instead of 51. So you would come right here and you would delete all of this on down to chapter 51. And then once you delete all of these, you would have to change the play order of the last remaining nav points. So let's say, for example, I delete that, and my chapter 30 is 35, so that means this would become 36, this becomes 37, and so on. 38 for this one, and 39 for the last play order. So all of these have to be in order, you can't skip any numbers, and again, make sure that everything you put in here is accurate to what is in your book. You can't have anything extra, and you can't skip anything or forget something that needs to be in here. So, that pretty much covers all of the editing that you need to do to all of these files before you can actually create your EPUB. So now the process to actually create the EPUB is extremely simple, and I will show you that very, very quickly. Less than 60 seconds, I can show you this, okay? So you come back here, you've got your three items that you're going to put inside of your EPUB, and this is all you have to do, very quick and easy. You come in, you select New WinZip File, and then you change it to, you know, whatever the name of your book is. My first book was the Gothic rainbow. So you change it to that. And then you open up the zip file. And the first thing you do is take your MIME type and drag that in. The reason that you do this, and you can turn off include system and hidden, make sure compression is set to normal. Now the reason that you do MIME type first is because when you actually create the EPUB, the readers are going to be looking for that file first. So if you were to just take all of these files here and just drop them in, your EPUB will probably break because the MIME type might not be inserted first into the file order. So make sure you just drop in MIME type all by itself. Then you can just take both of these folders at the same time and drop those into here as well and click Add. And that's it. And then you close it out. And then all you do is come in here and change zip to EPUB. Ask you if you're sure, you say yes, and that's it. You're all done. You have just created your very first EPUB file. But we're still not done. Just because all your files open successfully in a web browser doesn't mean your EPUB structure is conforming to all of the EPUB standards. So, once you have created your EPUB, the next step is to run some validation software on that EPUB to make sure it has no unseen errors inside of it. Now, do not skip the validation process. Validating is an essential step, and if you skip it, your books could easily be rejected from publication due to mistakes you didn't even know were there. So, the software you'll need to validate EPUB files You'll want to use a standalone validator, such as Flight Crew. And there are actually websites where you should also double and triple check your validation using EPUB Check. You can check out EPUB Conversion, 
and you can also check out uh, validator.org. Now, why use three different resources to validate your EPUB? Because different validators frequently find different errors. For example, uh, Flight Crew might find an error that online EPUB check software will miss. Therefore, it is crucial that you take the time to validate your EPUB in as many validators as possible. Remember, one minor little mistake can cause your file to be rejected. So, it's important that you not miss anything. And typically, the errors are very explicit and even tell you right down to the line number where you have made a mistake. Now, once you have validated that your EPUB conforms to all the validation standards, try opening it up on your local computer and reading it. You can do this using free EPUB reader software. Again, I suggest checking on multiple readers, not just one. Not all readers will render everything the same, so it's important to check for consistency across multiple products. Some software to read EPUB files is uh, there's a Nook reader app, and different versions are available for different operating systems. And there is also uh, Sigil and Calibre as another one. Once you have successfully opened your EPUB in all of your readers and have it working properly, you're all done. Now you have a completed, validating, and publishable EPUB. So congratulations. Now that you have a fully validating EPUB file, you need to convert it to a MOBI if you wish to sell your book on Amazon. Now software you'll need to create and validate a MOBI file are Kindle Gen and Kindle Previewer. Now rumors have been circulating for a long time that the Amazon Kindle might someday gain the ability to read EPUB files and if that happens this step will obviously become unnecessary. But back when I made this video in 2013, you still needed to do a MOBI conversion. So here are the steps to make a MOBI file. The steps to create a MOBI file to use on the Amazon Kindle are extremely easy to do after you've made your EPUB file. First, you download and install Kindle Gen, and you just put it right here on your C drive. And within that folder, you should have your Kindle Gen EXE and a README text file. Then you take your EPUB file that you created and simply copy that into your Kindle Gen folder. Then go to your Start menu, go to Run, and type CMD for Command. Hit OK, and that will open up your command prompt. Then all you have to do is change your directory to the C drive. So you do that by typing CD and then a space, a capital C, colon, backslash, Kindle Gen. And then hit enter. And now you've just changed your directory to Kindle Gen. Then here, all you have to do is type Kindle Gen and the name of your file. So Kindle Gen space the Gothic Rainbow and that's it. And then you hit return and it will build out that file for you and it'll throw all the data in here right after you do it. So there you go. At the end it says Mobi file built successfully. It returns you back to a command prompt. And if we come back into this window and refresh the window, there is our finished Mobi file. And that's all you have to do to create a file that can be read on the Amazon Kindle. Well, that covers it. Now you know how to create an EPUB that not only validates to all the EPUB standards, but is also accepted for publication at all of the major ebook distributors around the world. Plus, you know how to convert that EPUB to a MOBI file for the Amazon Kindle, which at the time this tutorial was created 
was the most popular ebook reader on the market. So I hope you found this tutorial helpful and informative, and please feel free to share it with any other aspiring authors you know, and hopefully it will help them too. So good luck publishing those books. Thanks for watching, and uh, don't forget to subscribe and like. See you around next time.